welcome to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth, and we're here to preserve and promote culture in this benighted age, one weekly conversation at a time. You can subscribe to the Virtual Memories Show through iTunes or by plugging our RSS feed into your favorite podcatcher. You can find the RSS feed on our websites, vmspod.com or chimeraobscura.com slash vm. We're also on Twitter and Instagram at vmspod, at virtualmemoriespodcast.tumblr.com, and on Spotify, YouTube, and tunein.com by searching for Virtual Memories Show. And if you like this podcast, tell a friend. Or give it a mention on your favorite social media platforms. Also, please go to the iTunes store, look up the Virtual Memories Show, and leave a rating and maybe a review for us. That might just inspire Apple to promote us a little. You can support the Virtual Memories Show and get access to exclusive content with a recurring monthly donation via Patreon. Just visit patreon.com and set up your level of support. You'll get new material from our patron-only blog, and you'll also get to listen to my quarterly bonus podcast, Fear of a Square Planet, which features extra material from our guests and is only available to supporters of the show. So visit patreon.com slash vmspod or paypal.me slash vmspod and help me continue to produce smart conversation about books, art, comics, and culture every week at the Virtual Memories Show. Welcome to 2019. I am recording this at 11.30 on New Year's Eve, um, partly because I have no social life, and partly because I'm running a 5K race on New Year's Day, and I just want to make sure this gets posted in case I have a heart attack or something. Now, I took off last week for Christmas slash New Year's break, giving you guys a chance to catch up on the 73 hours of podcasts that I posted in 2018. Um, I won't object if you played those back faster than regular speed. I won't object if you skip the intros like you might be skipping this one. I, I guess that's OK. But I do hope you get a chance to listen to, to more than just one here and there. It was an amazing year for the Virtual Memories show with a lot of really wonderful guests and the most downloads we've ever had. Um, I keep an eye on the figures, even though I try not to chase numbers. And I know how silly that is for a podcast like this one. I mean, I, I push episodes on Twitter and such, uh, and I try and push back episodes too, to get people to, to go through the archives, but it's always a surprise as to which ones are really going to take off. So as far as New Year's resolutions go for the podcast, I guess don't check downloads as often would be a, a good one. Um, and this week's episode also comprises a resolution for some of my listeners, as you'll find out. But for me, I spent some time over Christmas at my in-laws in Louisiana, and um, and I worked on a list of, of prospective guests for 2019, as well as a kind of short list of, of heavyweights. And I, I resolved to chase them down, starting with Robert Caro, who has a book coming out in April, which gives me some sort of opportunity, I hope. See, the thing is, I, I looked back at 2018's guests, and those 51 episodes we did. I realized I recorded with four guests whose work has meant so much to me for more than half my life. Um, in in sequence, it was Dave McKean in sequence of episodes. I mean, not in importance. Dave McKean, Jaime Hernandez, Eddie Campbell, and Gary Clark. So, I want to do more of that. I want to get more guests whose whose work has you know been around for me for for decades. Uh, but at the same time, I I also want to get new voices on the show. Uh, so I've really been kind of trying to get outside the box or outside of my my cocoon, I guess. One of my big failures in 2018, as long as we're, you know, going through this whole self-flagellating thing here, um, is gender balance for guests. And this was easily the worst year I have ever posted in that respect. There were a few mitigating circumstances, weird cancellations, et cetera. But the, the upshot is that cascades into stretches of like 10 or 12 consecutive male guests and that's just not right. Um, I got to get better representation. I only recorded with two non-white guests this year also, which, oh, last year, which is a terrible job by me. Um, I did get stood up 
by Ivana Logbe at the Toronto Comic Arts Festival. So that's on him. That would have given me slightly better numbers. Um, but still, one of my podcast resolutions, besides going after some some big heavyweights, is to just record with more more women, more people of color, more people who aren't who don't look like me. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna try and make sure that's uh, that's part of our 2019 roster of guests. Now, as far as non-podcast resolutions go, um, as some of you listeners know, I took up running about six months ago, and I just want to go farther and faster and not worry that I'm going to have a heart attack. I have a few time goals in mind, but nothing I want to share here. And for non-podcast reading projects, as I mentioned in the guest list episode a couple of weeks ago, I was going to resolve to reread Anthony Pohl's A Dance to the Music of Time in 2019, but um, I got ahead of myself on that one. Uh, when I first read it in 2011, I did one book a month, and no matter when I finished it, I would wait till the next month to, to start the next one, uh, hoping that that would keep me from sort of plowing through a bunch and then losing steam and never finishing it. It worked just fine. Uh, this time around, I thought I would kind of just read them consecutively. What I didn't realize was I was going to have some time on my hands, and I ended up reading five of the 12 novels in the span of like 11 or 12 days. So I have seven left. I still plan on finishing it. Um, it just won't be a year-long reading project as I'd planned. We'll, we'll see what else I get up to. Anyway, let's get to the show. My guest this week is Criota Wilberg. Now, Criota was on the show a few years ago for a one-on-one. -on -one. This time around, we recorded a live panel at Cartoon Crossroads Columbus, or CXC, uh, last October. And we talked about her great book from 2018, Draw Stronger, Self-Care for Cartoonists and Visual Artists from Uncivilized Books. And that's where the New Year's resolution part comes in. See... A lot of cartoonists and other artists I know can improve their health and, and their art by making some changes to their work practice. And that's what Draw Stronger is all about. Creota does a great job using the comics form to explain how artists can tie their muscles and tendons and knots uh, through, through overwork and bad posture and a series of bad practices. And she goes into how they need to to treat their bodies the way professional athletes do. Um, it's a really neat book, Draw Stronger. It's got lots of advice on exercises, posture, other work that artists can do to take care of themselves better. And as far as I'm concerned, that is a New Year's resolution for a lot of the cartoonists I know. There are also things in there that I've sort of adopted myself, um, just because I'm also sitting at a desk for a lot of the day. Um, so, you know, Draw Stronger isn't just for uh, cartoonists and visual artists, but that's where it's focused. I do believe it should be part of the, the kit that's handed out to aspiring cartoonists and even some veterans, um, you know, along with a compass and a cyanide pill and, and the other standard stuff. Um, but it really has helped a, a non-artist like me with some of my repetitive stress actions. Um, so even if you're not at a drawing table regularly you might stand to gain from checking out Draw Stronger. Now, caveats. Uh, as mentioned, this is a live episode, and we also took questions from the audience. I didn't have the mic set up to pick up their audio that well, so I'm going to interject during those segments this way and tell you what the questions were. Oh, also, I started the main recorder like a minute late, so the first few moments are from the backup recorder. You will easily tell when it changes from one to the other. And here's Criota's bio. Cartoonist Criota Wilberg draws from decades of experience as a massage therapist and educator in health sciences and the arts, creating a comprehensive guide to injury prevention for cartoonists. Her comics appear in The Intima, a journal of narrative medicine, Comics for Choice, and The Graphic Canon. She is at work on her first full-length graphic novel. Criota is the first ever artist in residence at the New York Academy of Medicine Library. And now, the Virtual Memories Conversation with Criota Wilberg, live from Cartoon Crossroads, Columbus. So let's start with a new book. Okay. Where did Draw Stronger come from? How did you get the plot? And why does the guy die at the end? I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, but tell us about Draw Stronger. You've ruined 
Indeed. Um, so about six or seven years ago, I was guest faculty at uh, the Center for Cartoon Studies up in Vermont. And um, my husband and I were both up there for the school year. And my students would all sit with their books in their laps, like curled up around their books, drawing like this. And I've been a massage therapist now since 1987, right? And my area is orthopedic injury and, you know, sports injuries. And I would just watch these people draw. And all I could think was, you guys are screwed. Because, you know, there's students like coming into this environment where suddenly they're drawing eight hours a day where they haven't been drawing that intensively probably before. And so I got online and I was looking for, you know, injury prevention materials for artists for my students so that I could just kind of like show them to these resources. And I couldn't find what I liked. There would be like a page and it would be like, do this to warm up before you draw, but there was no rationale for why you needed to do this, what the warm-up was doing or anything, and I could also see some holes in it. So it was like, all right, I can't just throw a website at these people. I guess I will have to write the book. So <laughs> I started like, I started um, by making a 60-page mini-comic um, called No Pain. I, I told my husband I was going to do this, and he was like, that's great, you know, knock yourself out. I used his Cintiq. I didn't have a Cintiq. It was very exciting. Um, and I gave him the, the first draft, and he was shocked. He thought it was going to be nine, page long, nine pages long, and it was 60. Actually, it was 80. And then um, I trimmed it down. We're just talking about you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Bob Zakoriak, everybody. Um, so, so yeah, so it started as a series of mini comics because I could not find a resource that I thought was like just a good singular resource for artists. Um, so first there was no pain, and then I made another mini comic of about 40 pages called um, First Aid for Drawing Injuries. And then after that, I was starting on a, another 35 page book about back pain. And I was getting repetitive stress injuries from trying to staple 60-page mini-comics together. So I talked to Heidi McDonald who, um, from the Comics Beat, and I asked her who she thought a publisher might be who, was interest, who would be interested in um, publishing a book about injury prevention. And she suggested uh, Tom Kaczynski and Uncivilized Books, and he went for it. So. so how did you develop the the practices that are in here in terms of treatment and ex well exercise not treatment. right right um, so so the so the book is essentially the standard of care for repetitive stress injury I've been a massage therapist specializing in orthopedic injuries and sports injuries um, for years I used to work on the New York Giants football team in the early 90s um, and this is what this is essentially what medical professionals suggest, you know, in order to prevent injury or to, like, help manage pain while you get yourself to a doctor. So these are, like, basic corrective exercises that people can do, you know, at home in their own time. But all the principles are essentially in standard practice today. I guess what I'm wondering is, did you have to tailor it for, how, how do you tailor oh, yeah. it for cartoon? Okay, so it is specifically for artists. Mm -hmm. It's for artists who draw on a smaller scale. So if I was doing a book for, say, muralists, <laughs> I would do a lot more with, say, Shoulders like shoulder and, pectoral girdle yeah. exercises. So I have some shoulder stretches in there, but not nearly the same uh, thing. So, uh, or if I was doing a book that would, was for people working in an office, like at a, you know, doing word processing or, you know, at a phone all day or whatever, again, the exercises would be slightly different. So this is specifically made for people who draw. Um, and the medium is not necessarily the issue. So you can, you know, you can draw on paper, you can draw on a Cintiq, you could, you could like, draw on your iPad, but like the the idea of the scale and the practice of drawing are the things that like hold this thing together. And when it comes to identifying these sorts of things, 
do you have the uh, like the moment in American Splendor movie when the Joyce Brabner character is identifying everybody's psychological ailments? Like, can you look out at some of the cartoonists here and figure out? You know, I have a feeling that guy's. Oh, the you know, I I because I've been working in this area for so long. Um, yeah, I can, you know, but but for decades, you know, it's like not only can I undress a room, I can flay the room. <laughs> Good. So, like, I can imagine what people look like without their skin and without their adipose tissue. <laughs> and, like, so don't mean to make anyone feel uncomfortable. <laughs> it does get you over being nervous in front of a crowd. Yeah. When, when you, you're supposed to visualize them naked, but when you can visualize no, the skeletons, like you're, skeletons you're good. Or, you know, just, you know, with muscle. Um, yeah, because, you know, it's like when you're looking... When you're working with patients, you know, you do postural assessment, you're looking at alignment, um, you know, misalignments of the skeletal system are going to uh, make people develop certain tendencies toward certain types of injuries. So this is just, you know, this is just kind of all in the course of a day mm -hmm. for me. Is there a most common cartoonist ailment? Um, everybody, well... That's a good question. I think it really depends on the cartoonist. Like, everybody's up on carpal tunnel syndrome. Like, it's the sexy injury, right? It's starting to get out of favor. Like, uh, But, you know, the use of phones and devices also mean that there are a lot more thumb injuries now than they used to be. And um, people don't necessarily distinguish drawing time from computer work from other types of things. So... It's harder and harder to say, like, what would be a specific injury yeah. for artists because, like, the close work just kind of keeps, like, mm -hmm. getting blended. And where did graphic medicine begin for you? Okay, yeah. So graphic medicine is... Everybody familiar with graphic medicine? Yeah, I should ask that. <laughs> Explain what graphic medicine is first, and then we'll... Uh... So graphic medicine is an area of comics that essentially inhabits, like... Anything that is comics that is about, like, the body or health or medicine. So if it can stimulate a conversation about health care or about, you know, health, then it qualifies. Um, so that could be... But you're saying and there's even a website... Yes, graphicmedicine.org, yes. And they, there's a yearly conference. It's the whole... It's its own thing. It's kind of amazing. It's niche, but it's pretty amazing. So it can be things like patient narratives, but, um, and, you know, cartoonists who have had, like, different health issues often do a lot of, like, comics, autobio comics about themselves. Um, but for me, you know, there are also, like, EC horror comics about, you know, people who refuse medical treatment for their cancer, and then they be become consumed by their cancer, and they turn into a monster, and blah, blah, blah. And it's like... That works for graphic medicine for me because it also helps to stimulate conversations about perceptions of illness and disease and what that means and things like that. So I can turn anything into graphic medicine. Which is a question because you mentioned your, your history as a massage therapist. Yeah. Where did comics start for you? Um, well, comics started when I was like 10. As it should. <laughs> as it the should. golden age, as yeah. we know. Yeah. <laughs> so when I, you know, when I was a girl, I read a lot of comics um, because you could just get them on a rack at the Safeway in my hometown. Um, and, of course, I read a lot of Archie's because mm -hmm. they were very exciting and interesting. And then... Um, when it came to making them? When it came to making them, I, I've drawn... I've drawn more or less all my life. Um, but I was a dancer and a choreographer for a long, long time. And then when I stopped doing that, um, actually before I stopped dancing, I had been drawing. And because I teach a lot of anatomy, I also draw anatomical images for my own anatomy classes and workshops. Um, so No Pain was actually the first like mini comic that I ever drew. Before that, I'd been doing gag cartoons, but they were performative. So, uh, Bob... An, an example? Yeah. I, I don't have any images here, but um, Bob does a, uh, a performance kind of thing called Carousel, where cartoonists come and read their work. Um, and what I would do is I would make a gag cartoon 
that I thought was really funny, but I would have to explain a lot to like get people to understand it. So, uh, for example, I made a gag cartoon kind of in the style of The New Yorker where it, it was a baby shower for a demisid, which is like an eyelash mite. And there's a pubic louse and a head louse at the baby shower. Um, and the pubic louse has given the demisid diapers, called buggies, of course, because, you know, it's funny. Anyway, and the demisid is outraged, outraged. And she's, <laughs> and the reason this is funny is because demisids don't have ani. So, <laughs> so it's, it's you know, humor, but. so it's this, it's this horrible <laughs> cultural gaffe where this, this insect has shown up to this demisids, you know, party and she's like given her a gift and she has like not even had the wherewithal to like do a little research to realize <laughs> that the offspring of this demisid is not, they can't poop. <laughs> so, um, so it takes about five minutes, but I set up the gag cartoon, the <laughs> but I walk people through it and like I explain it. And as I go, I hit, you know, the PowerPoint. And so there are like arrows and circles and like little graphics trying to explain everything that happens. So for a couple of years, I made comics just as performative pieces. Hmm. And then eventually I got into doing no pain. Yeah, how's the response been so it's, far for, for Draw Stronger? It's been great for Draw Stronger. We sold out the first printing, and uh, we got the second printing, so everybody's back orders are now satisfied. <laughs> are, are you so. getting letters at all, or, or letters, emails from, from people about, you know, you, thank you for saving my, my wrist? I'm getting, I'm getting a lot of tweets, like, thank you yeah. for saving my wrist or shoulder. When I did No Pain, I got this long, long email from this woman because No Pain was like uh, distributed to different comic book stores, you know, and I got this email from this woman in San Francisco who had to quit her career as a graphic artist because she had sustained a wrist injury when she was first starting out and she was in too much pain and she couldn't like keep doing the work, so she quit. And so like 10, ten years later, like here's this mini comic that she finds in this comic book shop in Berkeley and she wrote me this long very touching email mm -hmm. about how she really wished that like something like that had been around when she was first starting out cuz she it literally like changed her life that she couldn't draw so well, you have a, a blurb on the inside from uh, Lauren Weinstein also yeah. who I know went yeah. through neck surgery and all sorts of other stuff where I think she says some of the the same sentiment yeah. that yeah Again, I wish someone was teaching him this back then. Now, have you uh, been involved with uh, various comic schools or other institutions to kind of train the, or at least to, to give the, the students a background? Well, the center, like I said, Bob oh, and yeah, I were at the center for, yeah. yeah, at CCS, at the Center for Cartoon Studies. And also while I was there, I would do warm ups. Like mm -hmm. all of my classes, you know, my co-teachers were great because they would, like, give me time to, like, do warm-ups for the class. So we would do physical warm-ups, and we would do stretching, and we would do things to prepare them to work. And then I also taught an exercise class once a week that students could come to. And some of them, like, came faithfully every week. It was pretty amazing. And there were actually some nice changes in, like, some of their bodies. So it was it We was have our good. stereotypes. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Although I, I remember it was only when I was rereading this um, that I suddenly was hit with a flashback to the, the Marvel exercise book from mm. the 1970s. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it's something you've, you've ever seen or at least I've heard the legend it. of. I've seen it. Because, um, yeah, uh, Marvel published a, well, what the 70s idea of physical fitness was and, and athleticism with superhero characters doing all of these exercises and a little guide for everybody. I was a fat kid and, and just, you know, thought and my parents thought anything that would get me exercising through superheroes would be good. Was that sort of stuff, you know, did that ever play into um, trying to make something like this that, you know, uh, you do have a caped figure or cowled figure in this, but, you know, it's really Trying to fit people. into his costume, yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, the, so the illustrations in the book are really, you know, they're, I'm trying, I was trying to, like, create characters that, like, essentially were 
reminded me of my students mm -hmm. and were like demonstrating kind of like the the spectrum of different types of cartoonists so uh the the different cartoons are all kind of loosely based on people i know yeah. but I'm I mean, not there was a chris ware looking guy in there but i i you know his head wasn't big enough to be chris, <laughs> so i wasn't sure another friend of mine i think thinks it's him too, oh good okay <laughs> I, it's you know it's like yeah, they're based on people, but I'm not guaranteeing that they look exactly like them, gotcha. right? Uh, is there a thing you ha most hated drawing in the book? Uh, you didn't put anybody in cars, which is no. Is good, so. I did draw a little. I did draw little cars just in one spot. Yeah, cars probably were yeah. the worst. So okay. I was just like, no, it's they're cartoon cars. Yeah, Jaime Hernandez told me once that that's the thing that kills him. He doesn't know why he keeps the stories in Southern California because everybody has to drive and he absolutely hates cars. Yeah. But, you know. Inorganic shapes are really hard. Yeah. So, you know, for me, especially because I am, um, you know, it's like I do a lot of anatomical imagery. So actually sometimes just putting skin on people is really hard. Like, <laughs> and your, uh, her characters do point that out too. Some of them say, I, I have no skin anymore. And, <laughs> and, you know, I'm look, cold. My nervous system. <laughs> um, yeah, where did that begin for you? Where did you train in terms of learning to, to draw? I'm essentially self-taught. Okay. I, you know, it's, yeah, I like studied art in school and I took some drawing classes, but I've just, I've drawn all my life. Mm -hmm. So. And anatomy. And I've you taught anatomy right. for 30, yeah, 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 yeah. So. And you, as we mentioned in your bio, you were the first ever artist in residence at the New York Academy of Medicine Library. Right. How did that happen, and what did that entail? What's so, the, uh, so the New York Academy of Medicine um, has the library has a historical collection. They, so they have books, medical books from as early as the late 1400s, and I got to get my hands all over them and like read them. It was very, or not read some of them. Like, you know, it's like they're in Latin or whatever or Old English. I have tried to read Old English, and it is a bitch. Yeah. So. <laughs> um, but uh, I, I teach, I had been teaching anatomy for artists at the library using the collection. And when I teach anatomy for artists, I draw directly on the model. So no one draws skin in my classes, like skin is bad. Like so I draw bony landmarks and then I draw the muscles on the artist's model and then as the model poses, you know, and I give lectures about anatomy and then as the model poses, Everyone tries to draw the musculoskeletal system as it's demonstrated to us by the body before us. So I try to train people to look underneath the skin so they can get a better understanding of anatomy so they can take these ideas with them and like use them in their own work. Um, and I'd been doing that. I did things like books about the wandering uterus, right, which is a model for women's medicine for over 2,000 years even longer than that, crazy. Yes, your uterus can like literally move around your body and that's what's causing your chest pain or your migraine or whatever. <laughs> so for women's medicine for a long time, it, you know, it's like any anytime there was a symptom present, it was about getting the woman's uterus back into her pelvis because <laughs> it had gone somewhere else. Yeah. Even ankle, so sprain, like ankle pain, it's your uterus. Like we got to get your okay. uterus out of your ankle. So... <laughs> Anyway, I'd been around the library long enough. The director made a joke that I should be the artist in residence, and I was like... That's a job. That's, yeah, <laughs> it was like, okay, we're going to do it now. Mm -hmm. And did it change once you had a title? Was there any you know, responsibility at that point? I, I got a desk, yeah. and I got the same access to the, uh, to the materials as a research fellow. Mm -hmm. um, and that was pretty great. And it was supposed to be six months, and then I needed more time, and they just said, okay, fine, stay a little bit longer. So I think now, like, I essentially have the same rights and privileges as a research fellow, or, like, even though I'm not there anymore, like, past fellows are, are acknowledged as such. It? And so I think I'm, I'm um, uh, recognized as, like, a past artist in residence. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, what do artists need to learn most when you're teaching anatomy? What's the, like the right, most common thing right. that they really need to get under their belt? So if you understand the skeleton, then you can pretty much figure anything out. Um, because the skeleton is rigid, rigid, 
and the soft tissue around it will change as a person moves um, and create curves or, you know, so the joints will move and the soft tissue will move, but the bones are rigid. And once you start to understand the organization of those rigid structures, then you can also start to play with that rigidity to keep things looking understandable, but to like maintain your own style and then also maintain anatomical consistency. So. You know, I was uh, talking to Jason Lutz yesterday, and uh, apparently when he gave his students uh, some of pages of Berlin for them to, to look over and edit before they went to collection, um, apparently he, twice he uh, accidentally gave a sixth finger to a uh, character. <laughs> them six instead of five, and, and the students were really happy to catch a mistake from That's a guy. That's really they, funny. They, they considered their That's their, pretty their great. Chief. He was probably delirious from, like, drawing Trying to draw 600 yeah. pages, yeah. Um, the... The one thing you would want as a takeaway for you, someone reading it? Yeah, you have to take a break. Take a goddamn break. Yeah. So, and you have to step away from your work. Like taking a break, if I'm drawing, taking a break does not mean that I'm going to just like sit there and start like looking at my phone or check my email or something. It means you have to literally stand up and move away because you need to change your posture and you need to get a little bit of movement in there before you can go back. Mm -hmm. So breaks are literally the most important thing you can do. It's a weird thing. Since I got the, the Apple Watch a couple of months ago, I'm much more caught. I mean, it, it tells me every hour, get up, walk yeah. around. Yeah. and there's, But you can't do it just standing near your desk, and you really have to move around a bit before it'll give you the little chime saying you've, you've done you enough. You've fulfilled you your obligation you know? yeah, to your body, um, and now you can go sit. It's weird, but you know, yeah. if you need inducements like that, it's, yeah. it's there. There's a, there's a great app called Anti-RSI, and it's either free or it's like three bucks or something. It's really cheap. Um, but you can, when you, you know, and I draw on my Cintiq, so if I get, like, too involved, I can't, like, something has to remind me to take a break. So, um, and because I also... I have um, I get visually induced migraines, so I have to take a break every 25 minutes. So you think you have it bad having to take a break every hour, hour and a half? It's like you have no idea. But while I'm working, this big black box will appear from anti RSI, like right in the middle of my work, and I can move it out of the way or postpone it or whatever. But if I do, it's my choice, and I'm also being an idiot because then I'm going to get a migraine. But the, the, the app is really great because it, it gives you, like, that visual reminder. You don't have to kind of, like, set it or whatever, and you can play with it. But you also, like, if you ignore it, you know, you have to deliberately ignore it. <laughs> and then you're going to be in trouble later. <laughs> you mentioned it's the same with tablet or paper, but... Are there aspects of, e of either one that are more likely to, to cause uh, so, RSIs as you see them? Or is it really comparable just because of the posture and everything else? Uh, repetitive, repetitive stress, stress. injury. Sorry. Yeah. So, so with, with any type of medium, I think that the problem is too much similarity of movement or posture. Mm -hmm. So... If you are drawing on, if you're drawing on paper or if you're drawing on a tablet and those surfaces are flat on the table, that's going to cause you to lean over, right, and work so that you can, like, get your eyes perpendicular to your surface. Um, so that's not so good. If you have, like, a slightly raised, like, angular surface for your, you know, if you're using a Cintiq or a laptop, you know, whatever it is, or paper... Like, that's why drawing desks are on an angle, right? That's better. Um, some people will, like, use an easel or have their Cintiq up at eye level, and then they'll work with their arm this way. So what brings your body up is going to be better for you. But even if you have perfect posture and you're, you know, you're using big, you know, you're making big lines and using your shoulder or whatever, if that's all you're doing, you can still get injured because you're overtaxing that one area. I guess I was wondering, with the Cintiq, you're, 
you're doing the input and it's going up on the screen, right? You're not seeing it on the, the I'm Cintiq No, itself. with the Cintiq, I'm drawing on the surface oh, okay. and I'm uh, seeing it there. Seeing, okay, I wasn't sure if it yeah. was a disconnect between no, the No, so the with, with a that. tablet, okay. you might be drawing on the tablet and then seeing the display. Yeah. And that is probably a better way to organize That's what I was wondering, because you're yourself. looking in a different place than your, your hand. Yeah. So I wasn't yeah. sure if that changes the Yeah, so that's, again, dynamic. going to improve. However, if you're drawing on that tablet and you're keeping your arm relatively still and just making motions with your wrist all the time, you're going to get wrist, you know, if you're not taking breaks, you're still going to injure your wrist. Mm -hmm. If you're making motions with your shoulder all the time and you're not taking breaks, you're going to injure your shoulder. So, like, whatever you're, if you're using something all the time, then that's going to be a problem if you're not taking a break and taking care of it. Does that make sense to everybody, right? So, so is once an hour good enough? Um, for some people, yes. For me, no, because of my, because of my crazy eyeballs. But, you know, for some people, once an hour is fine. You know, if I was, if I was a 20 year old, you know, I might even say a 20 year old could do like every hour and a half. You know, and they would probably be okay. But, like, the older you get, the more you have to pay attention to it. And, yeah, and so the breaks are important. But, you know, in the book, I talk about, like, thinking like a cartoonist athlete because, let's face it, it's like, you know, you're drawing with a stylus, but if you can't pick up that stylus, that stylus isn't going to draw for you. <laughs> That's what makes me nuts about people saying, did you draw that on the computer or by hand? It's like... The hand is holding yeah, on to the stupid style. Like, it's not... Maybe you get a telepathic one that you can... Yeah, you know, I know. <laughs> it's like, even if I drew it with my mind, I'd still probably have to practice. You know, so it's like... So it's it's interesting that people assume that yeah. if you... Anyway, enough about that peevishness. <laughs> but, um, but, yeah, like, you have to think about yourself as an athlete because the, your most important instrument is your body for drawing. And if you can't, like, pick up a stylus and move it around, then you're screwed, right? So you have to do things that are going to like make it possible for you to pick up that stylus and make something, make a picture. Best practices for festivals and cons? Are there things you try to make sure you're doing when you're on the road? Like so, this? yeah, so I, I actually stretch and um, bring like exercise tubing with me. Um, I do. <laughs> It's like very light, so I can, yeah. you know, but I also, if I can, you know, it's like I always find a hotel with like an exercise, a fitness room. So I didn't get there today, but I will be there tomorrow morning before I, I compare. I actually did. I, I was in my hotel See? and I got to bed at midnight last night because of a late dinner and I woke up at six and I thought if I don't go to the gym, right? inertia will take over right. and I will. It's going to be trouble. Yeah. So yeah. I just, 6.30 in the morning. And the great thing with the comics-related show is not a lot of people are down there at that hour. So yeah. I was able to, to yeah. go for a while and sweat like Patrick Ewing, which is my, my thing. Um, one of the things that came up in your, your slides just now, the, mm -hmm. uh, the embroidery and, and needlework yeah. stuff. Can you talk about how you incorporate that into to graphic sure, medicine? Sure, sure. So I... She does um, a lot of different things. I know, <laughs> weird. So I do a lot of uh, needlepoint and embroidery. Um, and that work is also with medical imagery. So, like, I'll take MRIs, my own MRIs, or friends' MRIs, or x-rays, or fetal ultrasounds, and I'll, like, import them into Photoshop, and I'll make patterns from them. Um, but uh, I also am, I will also sometimes make comics with embroidery. Um, most comics that are embroidered are often about... Um, they're often about like uh, ideas around femininity or the feminine or um, other things like that, and I, I am, I mean, the Wandering Uterus. I'd say that's a feminist comic, but like I, I couldn't figure. It didn't seem like I should be embroidering that, but mm -hmm. but I do sometimes make comics like with medical themes uh, that are also embroidered, and I even found a way to pull that into um, my residency at the at the Academy of Medicine. So I studied the research, the history of sutures and ligatures. Which is sewing, there you go. Yeah. right? It's not decorative sewing, <laughs> but it's sewing. 
And so that ties also into like the histories of textiles and we can look at parallel histories of like men sewing and women sewing, right? And what, and women in medicine and men in medicine and what those different tracks mean, like going through history. So now finally I get to work on a graphic novel that's essentially like organized around the history of sutures and ligatures, but we'll have comics and then also some of those comics and other pieces will be done in embroidery. Okay. You're not allowed to use the title stitches. David Small already did that. Oh, so I'm you have not. To watch no, out no, no. Okay. I'm already good. But you know, I'm doing a, I have a mini, huh? I know, it's just being funny. but <laughs> Yeah, no, but like stitches is, you know, it's a big graphic medicine, like people worship that book, so it would be problematic. Yeah. Um, uh, but, but yeah, I right now, like I have a mini comic downstairs at my table that is um, Galen and Celsus, who lived a couple centuries apart, yeah. stitching up a gladiator together, like in ancient Rome. Mm -hmm. And um, so I'm working on this series called Stitch in Time, and it's Galen, the adventures of Galen, and he goes through time and like works on stitches up bodies with different like famous surgeons. So he's about to go to medieval France and do an autopsy with Guy de Choliac, one of Guy's patients. Yeah. Guy de Choliac loved Galen. He quotes him over like like eight hundred and eighty times in his like in one of his books. So I'm in my comic he's just gonna be like, Oh Mr. Galen <laughs> Little heart sister. Oh boy, time. he's like <laughs> giddy, giddy. So anyway. I just think I never asked you, where your what what are your drawing influences? Who, uh, who did you, I mean, you've got your own style, but. Right, right. You know. um, so I, I like, I am very attracted to very detailed work. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, the more lines in it, the better. Like, just like the more hatching, the more whatever, the more detail. Like, I just love that stuff. Um, so the Bernie Wrights and Frankenstein was just right up your alley. Oh, completely man. Then. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, um, you know, and also hence my interest in, um, um, the academy, you know, because it's like a lot of the a lot of the art in you know in those books, the illustrations is like very detailed work. But that kind of detailed work is also the kind of thing that's going to get you injured. <laughs> so, you're, so you're also studying irony. Along I'm also with, with studying irony else. at the same time. <laughs> um, but you know, that's another thing that I am really attracted to in the older in those older works are that you know these these surgeons or these medical people would need an artist to draw the anatomical illustrations of the cadavers they'd, you know, dissected or whatever. And there's no refrigeration. You know, the cadaver is, like, getting old. They're in a barn. You know, maybe the artist has studied anatomy or maybe they haven't, depending upon what they have to, you know, what the medical person has to work with. And I don't know, I, this is going to sound kind of gross, but, like, if you've ever seen a body, like, opened, it's just a big mess. You know, like I work for a surgeon sometimes doing anatomical illustration, so he'll send me a, a photograph, he's an orthopedic surgeon, of a surgery, and the instruction is more or less, here, turn this hamburger into something that people can see what's going on. I mean, he doesn't put it that way. Well, but I, I woke up in the middle of my knee surgery back in the, the 90s, <laughs> and... But they knocked me out again because I started yeah. making jokes. But yeah. at the time, the, the surgeon was like, well, uh, Gil, as you can see, we're, we're yeah, yeah, replacing yeah, yeah. The, the ligament. We're putting the, uh, the, yeah. the patellar tendon in there. And I just, uh, Doc, this looks like fantastic voyage to me. I'm not mm -hmm. picking up anything. Mm -hmm. And within a minute or two, they knocked me out again because I He guess, was stalling. He was distracting you yeah, while they were nobody like, wants the to anesthesiologist laugh they're, they're, was like yeah. frantically <laughs> getting you back under. Yeah. But, you know, I mean, so, so when, you look at these, when you look at these illustrations, it's also really interesting because some of them are, like, very inaccurate because, you know, there was, like, maybe only one artist available, but artists were working everywhere because people needed artists because there wasn't any pho photography. But the authority of all those little lines, you know, it's like they would just have to figure out how to make that stuff fit in there and work. And it looks great, and it looks like they know exactly what they're talking about because the lines are there. But there's no way that would work. There's no way they, yeah. that would work, but it's like, it's really, it was a really great lesson in drawing for me because sometimes, not always, like you can overwork something and kill it, but sometimes if you just keep, you know, scratching away at it, you can make things seem 
more authoritative or knowledgeable than you actually feel about them. Because the lines are there. The lines are telling you that thing is the way it is, even if it's impossible for that thing to be that way. Well, Lanier's in his presentation uh, earlier showed that it doesn't matter how terrible a drawing you've, you've made for yourself, you can make it better and more worthwhile by just drawing a square around it and putting a New Yorker logo above it. Sure. Then it just feels like it's got authority and it's, sure. it's yeah. this is great yeah. for the art yeah. now yeah. instead. But. Yeah, so if you, if you figure out a technique to give your work authority, like what you people win. culturally see as authority in the work, even if you just hate it, it's like sometimes people will be, they'll totally buy it, mm -hmm. literally, or just believe it, yeah. right? So let's get some questions from you yeah. guys. Um, either talking about your own comics related injuries or just things you want to ask Creota. Yeah. Not a doctor, though. Yeah. Everybody's clear on that, right? Not a doctor. I just want to add to what you just said about adding more lines. You know, we call, you know, what happens when we add more lines value for a reason, right? You're adding value to that image, you know, physical value of the amount of light and dark, but also value in that kind of intellectual interest for time spit. And um, it's, it's, you know, it's like a linguistic semantic thing. Right? Yeah, but, it, but, but it's funny, if you look at early Love and Rockets, mm -hmm. and, and if you look at that big Berlin collection by Lutz uh, downstairs, the early stuff has all the lines. Yeah. You know, once they get better, they realize, you know, we could tone down the number of lines and we're getting everything across, but that's a really good point about yeah, what it, no, it, it know, is. It's the perception really interesting. Of it, kind of a semantic art history thing to it. Yeah. yeah. The next question was, say you're drawing on a Cintiq and your forearm and wrist start to get sore and tingly. What should you do? Right. So, nice. so yeah, so rest, yeah, that's right? Good. So the, Rest is never an option. Well, so here's the thing. When you're... She will tell you. So when you're, there are a couple of different things going on. So when you're starting to experience pain, the first thing you need to do is try to find a way to like reduce the pain. So um, it's interesting that you brought up the tingling and shooting pain in the wrist because wrist pain may not be caused at the wrist. So if you have the pain in the wrist and you ice it, it may relieve the problem, but it may not because you may have a nerve entrapment in your neck. So this is also part of the thing where like rest has to start to take a precedent. So stretching, so in the book I talk about posture, because if you're just if you're just like taking care of yourself from the elbow down, <laughs> that may not take care of it, right? So Posture has to be part of it. That's why you need to like look at your cert, you know. So if you're experiencing pain while you're drawing, then the first thing I do is I kind of I I try to figure out if my fault if my posture was faulty. Like am I doing something mechanically wrong right in this moment? And if I am, then I try to fix it. Another thing I will do is um uh, uh, I try not to work in one position for, say, longer than an hour. So if I have a surface that I can, like, re-angle, I will do that, or I'll, like, shift my shift my things around. Or also, like, with the, the key tabs on the side of the Cintiq, where you can just, like, hit a button and, like, you know, make this, you can program the Cintiq to do some things for you. Um, I'll start reaching for my laptop to do the commands over there, because that way I have to move. So it's faster if I use the key command on the Cintiq, but it's better for me physically if I hit the stupid, if I reach over to the laptop and hit the button and then go back. So, you know, and when you start to get in pain, then you have to start doing something, right? Um, if, if the painful area is the injured area, then you can also, like, ice no longer than 20 minutes tops, right? But, like, gentle stretching movement and again just like those short breaks because you know it's like you can take a break for five minutes or you can like get your project done and then not be able to pick up a pencil for a week <laughs> so like what's you know where's the trade-off so you know also at the same time i understand you know just like just as with professional athletes or dancers or whatever like there are some there are some times where you just have to do the thing you know, it's like I performed on a broken foot before. I just taped myself up and, you know, like adrenaline is taking care of it. And that was that. Um, and then I couldn't walk for, 
you know, two weeks after that. But, you know, I made that decision and that's what I did. So I don't, I don't deny anyone their autonomy that way. Like everyone is always free to make a choice to just keep working, but you have to understand that there's going to be a price to pay. So if taking a break, if even taking a five minute break every hour is not an option, which boy, <laughs> sure. you know, that's like. It makes your drawings better. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And you'll like your drawings better if you stop, right? So, and it's not like you don't have to stop thinking about it. Mm -hmm. Like you can still think about drawing while you're taking a break. But yeah, so so see what's a, like, is your posture okay? Mechanically, are you working well? Uh, fix your workstation, try to move more. If you're working on a Cintiq and you've been hatching tiny, just blow up the area and hatch big. If you've been working really big and you can shrink the area and work tiny, then that will also like, so if you can like mix things up, that will help a lot. When you're drawing with a stylus on a surface, you're pretty much stuck in the pencil grip. Because most styluses can't, like you can't work on your Cintiq. Can I borrow your pen for a minute? Oh, sure. So like with the violin bow, you can't do this on the Cintiq, like this, without like fl over flexing your wrist and like giving yourself trouble. But if you have a pencil, you know, then you can like switch your grip around and do like different size lines. So if you can flip your grip, you have to train yourself to draw with this grip before things go south, right? <laughs> but if you can like take some time to train yourself to like use different grips, then that will also help a lot. And then, ultimately, you have to, like, get some exercise. And you may have to go to the doctor, you know, and see a PT, depending on what you're doing. Does that help? Does that make sense? Yeah. So first aid first, but then, like, second aid second. Like, you're going to have to do this, the next string after that. But, yeah. I should ask, you and, and Bob, I think, both have the, the converting desks. The, the standing... Bob has seat. a standing desk. Okay, I, don't, I remember he I, had one. Yeah, I have a Cintiq, and then... Gesundheit. And then I just, like, put my laptop on a box. Okay, you, you have the fake <laughs> version of that then. Because I wasn't sure if that, you know, changing posture is also going from sitting to standing, because my wife bought a table after seeing the one that Bob had. Yeah, so. So, so even if you're doing that, you don't want to stand all the time, and you don't want to sit all the time. And I'll also just raise and lower my chair. Okay. So... You know, I'll, um, if I'm working at the Cintiq for a while, I'll raise my chair by six inches and like work it in again, and then I'll lower my chair by like nine inches and I'll work up here so that my body has to keep like shifting around. So I'm not just locked into the same posture over and over because that's where you get in trouble. Questions? Mm hmm. Next question was When did people start to figure this stuff out? Was there a generational aspect to it? So, athletically speaking, training always improves with each generation. So, when I look at dancers now, I'm not dancing anymore, but, uh, you know, like, when I look at dancers now, I am just like, oh, my God, I never would have gotten a job if I was dancing now. But I would get a job because I would have the benefit of the same training they have. Mm -hmm. So, like, training is constantly improving. Athletic training is constantly improving performance. So that's true of all training. And so that would be true of, like, the data in this book because, again, it's like, you know, the, the um, it's just, like, practice and expertise that brings things forward. So cartoonists, you know, like, no internet's generation yeah somehow some people worse shape than maybe yes and no some people get lucky and and you know they have pain but they have learned how to manage it and a lot of people drop out we just don't know who those people are yeah. i mean i know like with you know like the 1950s cartoonists often had like a 10-year lifespan then they went out and did something yeah, well, and more assistance and studio stuff too. Yeah, well, yeah. You know, it's something that hit me. I was, um, I did one of these with Eddie Campbell recently because he has a book out about um, the San Francisco newspaper cartoonists of the turn of the century, 1910s, around there. And it just had this one comment about how life expectancy in the U.S. in 1900 was 47. 
And when you think we've added 25 years to that at a minimum, you know, things progress and people last longer. I know we've and, added know. like 35 years to that. I thought it's 70. No, no, that's I, right. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we're in uh, late we're like 70s, at, early at 80s. 80s. So, yeah. yeah um, but yeah, that's along those lines of things that, you know, maybe those cartoonists were fine, but, you know, they were also dying by the age of 50. Uh, so right. Yeah. Sort of I mean, there are a lot of different factors, but essentially, um, you know, and a lot of people, like a lot of people had to quit, like had to quit before they could even start. And we wouldn't know who those people were because they didn't build a big enough body of work for us to be aware of them. Mm -hmm. um, also, at the same time, like being an artist in those days was like a career choice that could make you money. So more people would be feeding into that. So if you're, if you're talented or smart or both, and then you're lucky enough not to like have a debilitating injury, then you get a career. But you may be talented or smart and unlucky, and then you're screwed. And then you could just be untalented or dumb or both. You know, it's like there are all <laughs> these variables, right? <laughs> so, so, um, so yeah. So like we, you know, we benefit from like all of these like applications and experimentation that like keeps driving, you know, driving performance forward. So you know, I'm, you know, I think it's the same with you know art and drawing that it is with athletics or anything else. Like we were all benefiting from the previous generations. So, and you know, we, we can like, we learn a lot from sports injuries and like all sorts of other stuff, so. This was a comment from an artist who'd been having back problems, but changed her posture and positioning and elevated her drawing surface and has seen it subside. Well, and regular exercise helps a lot, you know, because the other thing is, you know, one thing about like previous generations is people walked more. And, you know, when we're drive, like driving car seats, you know, I live in New York, so we don't have a car. We don't need a car. So we rent cars. So I like get the benefit of like testing out all these different car seats. But some car seats are really bad for you. Like they force you into like this flexed posture, like or the backrest pushes your head forward because they expect you to recline a little bit and then watch the road like this, but that will just make me sleepy. So like I try to sit with good posture, but they really force you into poor posture. So, you know, so that you're like bringing yourself upright is good. And then, but we have these other factors to factor in. So also I really encourage everyone to have some kind of physical, ex like regular exercise practice. You know, like yoga, swimming, walking. I'm like, okay, fine, walking. But I would prefer it if, like, it was a full body, something that you did, like, once or twice a week. Because as you age, right, it's also, by the time you're 40, you need to be strength training. I'm sorry, but there it is. <laughs> You, one, two, one, like, I've started running in the last couple yeah, of weeks. Yeah, but running so that, is I know, not strength I know it's not the training, same buddy. Thing. My, my it's brother's not on the my same ass thing. about this. Good, so, good, know. good for your You'll brother. You'll see me next year at the show. I'll be healthy. Yeah, I'll be so, up and, you know, you know, cardiovascular fitness is important, but strength training, too, because that's going to help you keep your posture as you get older, right? And, you know, I've been a massage therapist for 31 years now. And so a lot of massage therapists, if they last that long, they're all walking around like this. And when I was younger, you know, I would, like, I would see my teachers and I would look at their posture and it would just be like, oh, man, I have got to get to the gym. You know, it's like, also with dance, like, I was exercising a lot. But, you know, you really need to, you know, you really need to, like, look at older cartoonists. Look at whose bodies you admire and whose bodies you are a little concerned you might turn into find out what they do or don't do, and then do or don't do that, right? Does that make sense to everybody, right? So, so good, you're on, the right, uh, you're on the right track, but like in another 25 years, <laughs> yeah, be you safe. better be like, Pick this up, so. <laughs> you better be press. you know, it's like, I want a one reps max of at least 150 pounds. I'm kidding, but you know, it's like, <laughs> Because you need to, as we age also, you know, I'm 55. And as you age, your, tiss your tissues lose elastic elasticity, and they also lose hydration. Like I could go like drink for drink with an 18-year-old drinking water, and my tissues would never hydrate as much as theirs, right? So as your age, you age, your tissues are like setting you up for injury. 
So you have to like take extra steps to like make sure you don't get injured, right? So anyway, okay, lecture is over. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks everybody. Let's thank our guest creator. Thank you guys. And that was Creota Wilberg. Her new book is Draw Stronger, Self-Care for Cartoonists and Visual Artists, published by Uncivilized Books. You can find her on Twitter at Creota, which is K-R-I-O-T-A. And you should check out her website, which is creotawelt.blogspot.com, which is K-R-I-O-T-A-W-E-L-T dot blogspot.com. Dot com, although she hasn't updated that one for a few months. Now, after we wrapped, I did not get to ask Creota, so, who are you reading? But that's a hazard of doing a live episode. I do ask that of lots of my other guests, so if you want to hear their answers to that question, and maybe get some extra conversation, you'll need to become a supporter of the Virtual Memory Show so you can get access to our quarterly bonus podcast, Fear of a Square Planet. The third quarter episode features book recommendations and some extra conversation with Moby, Audrey Niffenegger, Mark Ulrichson, David Lloyd, Glenn David Gold, Ken Crimstein, Hal Mayforth, Lance Richardson, and Nathaniel Popkin. I'll get the fourth quarter episode up soon. Now you can support the Virtual Memory Show via patreon.com slash vmspod or paypal.me slash vmspod. I've got all sorts of goals and goodies in place for patrons, including that podcast, patron-only blog, handwritten show notes for every episode, my secret project that I blew off for an entire year, which I feel terrible about, and more. So go to patreon.com slash vmspod and support the art of fine conversation. Now, I recorded this episode at Cartoon Crossroads Columbus last October. That trip cost me about $900 between airfare, hotel, lift trips around town, etc. Uh, I recorded this episode as a panel and did a separate episode with Jason Lutz that aired last fall. And I got to hang out with various comics pal, but or comics pals, but uh, there was no business write-off or revenue generator tied into this one. So if you want to help defray some of the costs of the virtual memory show, like web hosting, travel, equipment, coffee, or just toss me some money because you think the show is worth it, then visit patreon.com slash vmspod or paypal.me slash vmspod and make a one-time or recurring donation. A special thanks go out to Joe Caruso, Michael Hacker, Michael Janicek, Paul Karasik, Fred Kish, Jonathan Kranz, Jack Les Camella, Teresa Lewis, Stephen Nadler, Payne Prophet, Dmitry Samarov, Stephen Solomon, Craig P. Steffen, Greg Tanner, Ford Thomas, Noah Van Skyver, and Garrett Zecker for going over and above in their support of the Virtual Memories Show. We have the full list of show supporters at ChimeraObscura.com slash VM. Our music for this episode is Fella by Hal Mayforth. Use with permission from the artist. Go to SoundCloud.com slash Mayforth, which is M-A-Y, the number 4, T-H, to listen to more of Hal's work. And that's it for this week's episode of the Virtual Memory Show. Thanks so much for listening and Happy New Year. We'll be back next week with Jerome Charon, author of the brand new novel, The Perilous Adventures of the Cowboy King, a novel of Teddy Roosevelt and his times. That one will post a day or two later in the week uh, because it's part of a virtual book tour. I have no idea what that means, but apparently you'll be able to win a copy of the new book if you participate. Now you can subscribe to the Virtual Memories show and download past episodes at the iTunes store. You can also find all our episodes and get on our email list at either of our websites, vmspod.com or chimeraobscura.com slash vm. You can also follow the Virtual Memory Show on Twitter and Instagram at vmspod, at virtualmemoriespodcast.tumblr.com, and on YouTube, Spotify, and tunein.com by searching for Virtual Memories Show. And if you like this podcast, please tell your pals and please go to iTunes, look up the Virtual Memories Show and leave a rating and maybe a review for us. That'll help us build a bigger audience. 
You've been listening to the Virtual Memory Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth. Keep reading, keep making art, and keep the conversation going. 